Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining yet another live stream of the uh, Scalable Multiplayer Game Design. Um, joining me today are Roddy Kiley. Hey, folks. Did I get that right this week? Yes. Yes, I remembered. And Derek Reese. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah. Um, so today we've, we've all made, actually we've all, we've made a little bit more progress. Not a lot. Things have been a little busy, crazy here. Um, share my screen real quick. Can you all see my screen? Yes. All right. Are you, are you snapping at your doggo? What are you doing over there? No, no. I'm turning on the uh, TV in the background. That's usually where I throw Twitch. Oh, nice. So here, watching, watching you watch yourself. Kind yeah. of um let's see terminal i know this is really tiny i'm, I'm gonna make it bigger in a sec uh moves many things to config and sets explicit rotation right okay so if we go to um oh man so many so many things all right we'll change oh that's not useful at all Okay, github.com, Red Hat Game Dev, SRT Game Server. That's curious that uh, that's the first thing that's there. All right, um, am I still working at a branch? No, let's see, commits. Pod density mass. Oh, maybe I didn't. You no, push the okay. changes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it does that explicit rotation. Okay. Um, so we had some challenges with uh, rotation that we were playing with last week or last show, uh, where I was trying to use Box Two D's like apply rotational force mechanism, uh, and and Derek essentially suggested like, well, maybe just like do pretend physics, and it, and it'll be more fun. And I said, oh, well, I guess. I guess that's a good idea. Oh, let me make sure that Zoom is working right here. Um, I think it is. Let's see. Well, everything yeah. looks fine on the stream. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's, I think I usually have to make some kind of change or whatever. Anyway, so um, so Derek suggested um, you know make physics fun again. And I, I got very frustrated because I didn't understand how to do that. And then I sort of said, well, let me, let me do my, what I give as my own frequent advice normally, which is uh, try it and see. Uh, and so one thing that uh, had been done previously by Jared, who didn't join us today, was he, he made this configuration um, class that would read stuff out of a YAML. And so we had some things that weren't in the config. So last episode, I had turned the ship into a cigar shape by giving it a length and a width. I made those configurable. Um, I gave the uh, the physics body a density, which is how box 2D calculates mass. It actually looks at the area of the 2D object and the density of the object, and then it calculates the mass. That way you don't actually set a mass. Um, so I made that configurable, and then I added some command line flags for that config. Uh, and then what we didn't have was we had nothing that actually told you what it had done if it pulled files in. So I made the logs barf out the actual config settings. Log barf, uh, it's my favorite. Yeah, everybody needs log barf. Um, so this is just adding stuff to the headers file. Um, I changed a bunch of log message log levels around uh, because it was acting kind of bizarre. It was really difficult to like, we're gonna have constantly be tweaking what logs get spewed at what log level, but it was like, it was either too verbose or it didn't tell you anything. Um, more log messages. Uh, and so let's go down to the, uh, I'm gonna find where I actually did the turny thing. Ah, okay, so here's, Here's the turny thing. So we had played with some of this last episode. We applied force to the center and you know it did its thing. Um, and so here's where I did the new turny thing. And so basically what I said was, uh, Derek had done some math back of the envelope a couple of episodes ago. Um, and I think you had said something like 180 degrees in a few seconds or whatever. And so I said, all right, well, let me, let me turn that into per second, which was 45 degrees per second. And then I said, well, if the server sleep cycle is really slow, like 
every time we tick through this calculation, if we turn the ship 45 degrees, like it's, it's going to turn in like in instantly in circles. And so I said, all right, well, let's, let's just kind of hack that down and divide it by the sleep cycle in milliseconds and whatever. Um, then I said, well, I don't care how fast or slow the server's going. If the tick goes by and you calculated that it should move you more than five degrees, you're not allowed to move more than five degrees. Then I said, um, or I should say, uh, we had been using the Y direction of the input from the game client as to whether or not the ship is turning. So that's your left and right arrow keys presently in the game client. And so Y would either have a value of one or negative one. And so if you multiply one or negative one by the number of degrees, you either get positive degrees or negative degrees, depending on if you're turning left or right. Uh, annoyingly, I shouldn't say annoyingly, uh, Box2D wants things in radians. Uh, and the way to convert degrees to radians is uh, you multiply by pi over 180. I probably should have created another variable here that's still not called degrees once it's radians. So bad, bad on me, but whatever. Um, and then we just transform the position of the object by rotating it to the new number of degrees. So we get the current position and we set it as being still there. So the, the X, Y coordinates don't change. And then we take the current angle and we just add the new number of radians to it and that turns it. Um, this apply force to center is actually still there. It just got moved up higher in the code. So essentially we apply the force to the center uh, and then we um, rotate the body. I do want to um, point out, I yes, use sir? a calculator when doing this math. I don't want to give a false impression that I know what I'm doing or anything. There was a calculator involved for sure. <sighs> Whatever. I don't believe that. <laughs> Um, so let's see if we can actually get this running. Um, uh, got so many things to do here. Okay, so let's see. Oh gosh, so many buttons. Okay, I need to go to SRT game server. Let me make my font bigger here. All right, sudo podman start Artemis. So I'm using Podman, which is um, Red Hat's cryo OCI run C implementation of a container engine daemon. Well, not, there's not really a daemon. It's it's a uh, daemonless. That's uh, the benefit of Podman, right? One of yeah. giant gaping security design flaw. Well, and it's just it, it only tries to do one thing, so it's it's super yeah. lightweight, right? Um, pseudo Podman inspect Artemis grep address all right 108805 if i pull up the config file no the config yaml oh god i don't know you would think i might know what i'm doing but i really don't <laughs> i mean kind of optional here was, for this stream where did we put it it was just down below there if you collapse the source oh, there i don't need to make files yeah 108805. okay so that's there so that's good uh, I should just be able to run the server then. Maybe. All right, it's running. Oh, why is it? What? What? Oh, that's fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there we go. All right, so file, new window, open recent SRT oh, bug, boogers. Uh, open folder. Oh, come on, really. SRT web client. I think it's just npm serve. Yeah. npm start. Oh. Okay. And I mean, all this code is completely open source too. So if you're crazy enough to try to follow us at home, you could try. So you here we go. Shot. I'm going to press the left arrow once and it turned. 
and I'm going to press it again, and it turns. It's, it's turning, and it's turning fast, too, which is good, because it really wasn't doing that before. And if I press up to apply thrust, it'll start to move. I think we may in need to direction. adjust. Yeah, and it's moving in the direction that the ship is pointed. Yep. And then if I turn the ship and apply thrust, it's moving still in the direction that the ship is pointed. And if I turn it like that, it'll eventually go in the right direction. So it actually functions. Like it, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. Now, this is pretty fast. We might want might to tweak that. Um, but the other thing is that we're also just kind of trying to get to some basics stuff here. Um, so one thing we could do to make the ship faster, just for giggles, stop this. Um, I'll change, I'll triple the force multiplier to, is that one? Hundred thousand million. So this is nine million Newtons because um, box 2D wants things in Newtons. So that is the thrust force multiplier for the main engine of the escape pod, if you will. And so now if I go to local hosts and we get a new ship, if I hit the up button, uh, we, I guess we move three times faster. The thing that I find curious is that for some reason we hit like a maximum speed and then it just like stalls out. So this is, more box 2D stuff that I guess I just, we just don't understand or I don't understand. Um, There's no speed limit in space. Well, besides, you know, the speed of light. Yeah, you would think that if you keep applying thrust that you would just keep going faster and faster and faster, but um, maybe, but I guess box 2D is like, well, you, you're applying, I don't know, whatever, whatever is the problem is the problem. Um, if I press the Ready, down arrow, do you know we go backwards, a... which is interesting, but whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a default friction. That's exactly involved, what I was right? going to ask. Yeah, default exactly. friction. Because I mean, ultimately, like we're looking down and there's two planes and they're stacked together. If you treat the ship as one and, the, and space as another, and the ship is sliding across space to a oh, certain I think, degree. Well, I think we have friction, friction turned off, right? though. Okay. Um, that so that's going to be in the B2D pod when we initial, initiate, initialize, initialize. So here's where you would have set friction or previously did set friction, yep. but I'm assuming the default is zero. Is there even a way safe to assume? Is there a way to check? Why is that not safe to assume, man? <laughs> what is? Because uh, we have C plus plus involved, and oh, don't we all even. know that's unsafe. <laughs> Fixture def. What is the fixture def? What what object are you? You are an A B two D entity. A B two D entity, which is its own. So is that a PB body? The B two D pod. So the PB stuff is all um, related to uh, protobuf. Okay, right. Okay. So the 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 a B2 fixture def is of type a B2D entity. Yeah. And then a B2D entity doesn't have a fixture def thing. It, it just is a thing. I'm yeah. trying to figure out like, where do I look in the, in the docs? The B2 fixture pointer right there. Uh, well, the one that has the friction setting in it, right? So it's either the body def or the fixture def. Well, the, the fixture def, yeah. So it's in the fixture def right. is the friction setting or was the friction setting. And so is it going to be a B2 fixture, I guess? Uh, B2 fixture def. I'm just looking through the documentation here now. I, I'm, I'm so asking I you yeah, which I documentation. In, in the Box2D documentation, right? Because that's Right, so it's question. the B2 fixture that we're interested in? So there's the fixture and then there's the fixture def, right? So the fixture def is the definition that creates a fish fixture object, an instance of a fixture object. Uh, you have friction set to 0 0.1. Oh, so that, there you go. Which is in the definition of the AB2D definition, which I don't know when that would get used. Yeah, and I don't remember either. But so we definitely have a friction in play that is not zero. Well, let's see what happens if we make a zero. Play. 
Try it and see, T-I-A-S. Well, it built, so that's, that's a good start. Step one, make sure it builds. Yeah, right. Um, refresh. All right, here we go. Uh, same, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> so it reaches some top speed and then, and then stop. doesn't that's go any faster. So this, um, this work, is this on master at the moment? Yes, I think so. Let me double check, hang on. Because I don't recall my rotation uh, working the way your rotation does when I tried it earlier. E hang on one second. Um, I want to pull up this to make sure, okay. Um, oh, you know what? I think this is the pod density mass branch. Yeah, so you're gonna want to check out the pod density mass branch. So do we wanna to switch to you to show your stuff now or what's the? Uh, well, let me switch over to the pod density mass branch and get things up and running here. Okay, let's see if we can figure out why this force thing doesn't do what we think it should do. Did this, oh no, the server stopped, which is why the ship stopped. Documentation. What is that? We don't use that here. Oh, someday, someday, sir. <laughs> body. Using a body. Position and velocity. Forces and impulses. Uh, you can apply forces. When you apply a force, Waking up the body, the body class has transformations, fixtures. That's not particularly useful. It's my goal for uh, this stream to try to get as many small PRs as I can to these repos during the stream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've got, we've got no friction or I had no friction. Oh, restitution. That's oh, and restitution. here's where you're setting density. I don't think this is getting used. I don't think this gets used to be honest. How do I find out where that would get used if it gets used anywhere? Right, click to, and find usages. At least that's the way it references. works in C line. Yeah, so there's no there's no references. That's not used. Yeah, it doesn't appear to be used, which is good. That means that my change actually didn't do anything. Um, PVT position, linear velocity, force, entity, PB body, fixture list, get fixture list for. Here's where you add a fixture. Ah, so you're doing set density uh, of get density and set friction of get friction, which is weird. I would assume those numbers come, come from one place and get set somewhere else. Yeah, but then they get, oh, it's like they get overridden later. Are we Are actually even using the serialized thing? The serialized stuff should be being used. That's how it gets in and out of the protocol buffers to go on the wire. Well, but so why are you... So if the serialized is what is used prior to the protobuf, why are you changing... Oh, this is the protobuf fixture. God, okay, I understand. Never mind. So I actually, I want to find the initializer. Here's a constructor which does nothing for the B2D entity, which is fine. Um, same thing here. So believe it or not, I found a Stack Overflow post that seems to kind of concern this. There is max allowable velocity for objects, and the 
post kind of walks around this, but the units in box 2D aren't meters. They're not metric units. They're kind of like some vague arbitrary unit. They, so I thought they solution, are metric units. So what they're saying in Stack Overflow is that that's a lie. <laughs> okay. Based um, on in, in most cases. Units. Yeah. And so yeah. what this person's solution was is they figured out a scale to use and applied that to some of the math they were doing. So like their ratio was like 48 to one to make their game, you know, play nicely or whatever. And then when they set up like the camera and all the draw multipliers and like the width and height of the object and everything, they use that ratio. So it might, we might actually have hit the velocity cap and we need to just scale our simulation out. So things, you know, our velocity caps much higher and our force is mm. much higher and all that I'm, stuff. Sure. I'm still not convinced that we're getting the friction that we want. True, yeah. We're in space, so, there's no friction in space. Well, that's the thing, yeah. So Roddy, you'll have to forgive me because I, I there's, not very, there's no documentation in the sense of like a clear flowchart and I can't yeah. read C worth of crap. So I don't understand, I don't recall which gets created first. Yeah, in I mean, the flow, I've been yeah. I'm just trying to grab your branch here. Did, have you pushed your latest changes to pod density mass? Yeah, uh, I think so. I was looking at them in GitHub, and it's pushed to your own clone, to your own fork. Is that right? No, I'm looking. I'm actually I'm looking at master on the server. So if we go to pull requests and we look at closed pull requests, yeah, pod, pod density, density mass, mass was merged 20 days ago. So why am I not getting that? Moves hmm. many things to config and sets explicit rotation. So our scheme, B2D pod, CPP. Yeah, rotate the ship by the effective degrees, which is radians, I lied. All right, I think I got the latest here now. We'll okay. see. Okay. But I'm still I'm still struggling with the order of how things get created. Too many files, not enough. Okay, add pod creates a factory and then an instance. Roddy, do you happen to know how the linear damping works? Like that's persistently applied with a clamp, right? To the maximum velocity. I think so that's for, for, for every simulation frame. Can we set, do we have that set to zero? Let me go look at the code. I have code. To Jason by okay, got it. So, okay, so in a entity add pod is where we create the pod, and so here's where we set the pod dependencies, which is doing pod dependencies, and then here's where we do B2D pod dependencies. So, B2D pod dependencies is the constructor is this function, which is where we're setting the fixture def. So we're probably inheriting some kind of default um, friction. Uh, create the pod using dependencies. We don't care about the pod because that's not the B2D stuff. We set the mass data, push the pod onto the list of pods. So what we can do is probably, is there a get friction? Yeah, there should be. But it's not a body, it's a it's a fixture, which would be in the fixture list. Get mask, get, get type, get data, as wake, bullet, enable the rotation, reset mass data, set, set, set. Well, here, let's do this instead. 
hard, hardcore hack method. Friction equals zero. Run again. <laughs> when in doubt, hack your way through it. And you know. Yeah. That's how you do it. Huh? Where the heck do we set any damping stuff? No, it's the same. So I think I think Derek, you may be accurate in the sense that whatever that post was saying about maximums um, may actually apply here. Yeah. 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 Um, so we have linear damping and angular damping set at 51 and 50. And those, that seems high. That seems Where? very high. Uh, in our box 2D.proto for Peabody. It I feel like those the, numbers should it be. It wouldn't be in the proto. High. The proto is just how we send messages across the wire. I would assume that it has to be somewhere in the, um, creation of either the body object or the yeah the the peabody object no no, no not the peabody that's the protobuf so it's before that so b uh a a things are ours b things are box 2d oh, okay gotcha b yes. things are the serialized stuff that goes across the wire that's right yeah that's so you right. can almost effectively ignore anything in the pbs because right. those are like defaults that we're gonna. Yeah, we're just uh, stuffing the data in there to go out. Yeah. So the out. question is, where is where the... are we setting it though? Yeah. yeah. Well, yes. Yeah, so I was just about to say, like, uh, the damping get angular damping. Where do you set the damping? That looks to be on the body itself. Set linear damping. Yeah, like I don't think we do that at the moment, right? And yeah, I would so also should, also, should, should there be no linear damping? I also just went through and got all your source code and stuff. And when I run it up, I don't see that I rotate, even though I see that the code is accurate, which is strange. Hmm. Rebuild? I don't know. But yeah, either way, we should probably set our damping to it zero. Work to we're in to space. Zero, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, well, like so the Roddy, for you, the challenge that you may be having is either cruft in the build folder or um, you're not sending the right stuff from the client because there may have been changes to the client as well. Oh, if there's changes to the client, I'm definitely not sending the right stuff from the client. Let me because... see here real quick. I've been off on a branch on the yeah, client. Yeah, there's a thrust rotation branch on the client. Okay, well, that would explain it. Yeah, which I guess I didn't merge yet. Oh, yeah, let me get reset hard head, get checkout master, get merge origin master. Really? No, oh, get pull origin master. <laughs> Aha, there we go. Okay. Let me go to the web client, SRT web client. Did I actually push the changes for that? Pull requests. Leave button. Oh. <laughs> I've, I've asked both Jared and uh, Michael to review the leave button, and they, they have yet to, yet to do so. Let me push my thrust changes. I don't know if I actually pushed them. Okay. Um, it's okay. You can point, uh, check out anytime you like, but you can never leave our game. All right. Broker endpoint, I don't care about. This is the uh, Spaceship California game now. Yeah, right. All right. So let me commit this. Um, So you're you're sending the rotation. You're, it's just not displaying it. Ah, uh, uh, okay. That makes so sense. give me a second here. All right. So I just pushed a thrust rotation branch to this web client. Okay. So if you merge your buttony stuff into there, 
that that mm -hmm. should do it. Okay, so let's go back to the server and play with the damping. So the damping is set on the body, not on the fixture. A entity B two D pod dependencies dependencies create P B two entity. Right. Okay. So I think that's where I would want to set the mass data or the linear damping. I really have no idea what I'm doing. So I'm just doing stuff. What's super fun here is if I can get this working in uh, WSL2, then I can take this, my server, my laptop, and a Raspberry Pi, and turn that into a cluster, and then try to scale this up in Kubernetes in my house, which is totally <laughs> going to be a waste of a weekend. But you know, I got vaccine number two coming up soon. So what else am I going to do? Set linear damping 0.0f. Ah uh, yes, the ship now is sideways, which it wasn't before. That's a good sign. Hey, what do you know? Pushing up now makes it go forward. Magic. All right. Somehow, oh, the protos got all worked. So I need to rebuild the protos because of the version of the things and the stuff. History, grep, proto. Oh, that's bad. I think it's in the dev container Docker file that we run the proto C command. Or not. Let's see. There it is. So now it starts rotated and pushing forward makes it go to the right. But using the left and right arrow keys does not make it rotate. Should it be the left and right arrow keys? Yeah. OK, well, the bug. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. You're running the same code I am, and it works for yeah. me. Uh, container supposed to fix this problem. That all works for no, me. No, I don't. But uh, I, don't you're, the server. I don't think it's the code that's the problem like something yeah, else i don't know what the problem is honestly cd yeah. where am i going i need to go to source proto and then i need to do that and now i need to do that so you can always slow down the server tick and crank up the log level to see what commands are coming in and what is actually going on. Yeah, so my server sleep cycle right now is set for 16, which would be normal speed, right? 60 frames a second. So will the calculation still work? What was the sleep cycle you were using when you were testing? It, the sleep cycle shouldn't matter in terms of turning. Like eventually it should turn if you're holding the button down. Um, so even at a sleep cycle of uh, one, it should still well, turn. If we have 16 divided by 1,000 times 45, that's a small degrees per tick. It could take hang, forever. Hang, hang on a second. To, uh, maybe that's my problem here. Let's check that back up. Uh, where is that? Is that an A entity or in B2D pod? Um, sleep, so 15 divided by 1,000. Is a small number times 45 is still a Sorry, small Sorry, you number. said 15 is the cycle? Or 16. Five, six, one, six? One, six, yeah. One, six divided by 1,000 times 45. 45. So that's 0.72. Degrees but I mean, second. yeah, 
No, that's not 0.72 degrees per second. That's 0.72 degrees per tick. Per tick. So, yeah, so that should still be reasonable in that case. Right. So, I mean, I'm, I was at a quarter second cycle and the quarter second cycle is 250 as the sleep cycle and it was turning. So changing my sleep cycle to 1600 causes me to rotate in a somewhat coarse type fashion. So there's definitely some weirdness somewhere. But I either mean, way, the rotation does work in the code is so there. And it's 250 divided right? by 1,000 is 0. 0.25 times 45 is 11. So I don't, I don't see why 16 would cause problem. Would cause a problem. Let me try 16 on my end for giggles. So the other thing that's happening here is that from a C, C++ point of view, we are multiplying three, we're multiplying an integer by a long divided by an integer and assigning it to a float. So there could be some conversion type issues going on here. Yeah, interesting. When I, so the linear, velo the velocity linear thing was definitely part of it because look at how fast it's moving now. Yep. Um, but you're right. The rotation thing is, is misbehaving um, with the server cycle set to 16. Oops, that is the wrong button. <laughs> Oops. Share again. There we go. Uh, I wanted to stop this. That's the stop button I wanted. All right, so let's reset that. So you said um, the challenge was the math. I think, it, yeah, I think it could be the fact that we're dealing with ints instead of floats, right? And C and C++ are kind of particular about your types and it does specific things. Like if you divide an int by an int, it gets- So we want a float times- A float. Well, a sleep cycle is not a float, is it? I can't remember. No, but you can cast it to a float easy enough. Yeah, and just cast it. And then- add How the do I do that? Uh, put float in front and then put it in parentheses. That's the old school C style cast. We should be so fine. Like, like that? Yeah. So I guess this should also be a float then, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, it works fine now. So then this should be a float. Yep, that'll fix the problem. I just fixed it here locally. Oh, do you want to uh, push yours or should I push mine? No, you can go ahead and push yours. I did exactly what you just did. All right. Oh, aren't decimal numbers already also already floats? Yes. Okay, so I don't need that. That can stay. Uh, so this should work. And then if I go back to launch JSON, Put that to 16 again, give this a try. What type of game are you designing? Is this what pair programming looks like? <laughs> to uh, so we're trying to design a space game um, where ultimately, yeah, that looks awesome. I'm going in circles. <laughs> I feel it's like just for the stream's benefit, you should unmute the music for a second. Wait, it's not copyrighted, right? It's totally free. Yeah, like, this uh, was just uh, unmute that for a second. Why? It's funny. It's been mute. I don't even know why it's not muted, um, or why it is muted. Unmute site. But uh, there's no sound because my laptop oh, sound Zoom's is broken. <laughs> no, my laptop sound is broken. So Fedora has been doing this thing where like my speakers disappear. And, and just don't ever reappear. And, and I don't know why. 
So. What's the joke I made last time? The only uh, working Linux device with actually functioning audio is on Mars on right Mars. now. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, all right, so I can stop the server. So that's cool. Okay, so you said you want me to push mine, Rod? Yep, Rod? go right ahead. All right, so git checkout dash b um, damping and floaty. Uh, let's see, we need a entity, right? Because that's where we set the damping. We need B2D pod, which is where we fix the floaty. And all the other files are protobuf files. Okay. All right, that's pushed. Okay, I'll grab it. Cool. Oh, so going back to the the game thing. So uh, we've been trying to build essentially a battle royale ish space game where you start in an escape pod, and as you fight with other players, um, you pick up the detritus that gets dropped, uh, and you can sort of firefly reverse style strap it onto your ship. Uh, and eventually you become this big lumbering mass and that pulls you closer to the center of the game universe where you end up having to inevitably fight all the other people that have big lumbering ships like yours. Um, and so we're in the very, very early stages of essentially prototyping client server using a message broker to handle the communication between the client and the server and all these other things. Uh, Roddy, you're up, I guess. Yep. I'm just going to see if I can get your changes here first. Oh, and sure. then, um, stop my, stop my share real quick. Yeah, actually, although I, I can demo my, my stuff without your changes in there. Fine. Um, do it. See if I can. Just, just <laughs> to make it a little more quick. I Go ahead. I dare you. I don't know why my, re my rebase command here is giving me trouble saying invalid upstream. I don't know why that is. Maybe I just don't have it, uh, name that. Anyhow, I will um, go ahead and just let me make sure it works, and then I'll go ahead and share. So essentially, what I was looking at, yeah, what I was looking at doing um, a while ago, we had raised an issue upstream. Um, let me grab the link here and I'll dump it in chat. Upstream. Upstream, yeah, the only place Who, where we exist here. At the who's moment. upstream? SRT Game Server, ah, okay. um, Red Hat Game Dev. Um, so there's an issue here. Actually, it's not even a server. It's not even the game server. It was the client. Provide a way to both join and leave the game session. So previously, you had added in the little green X, which allows you to leave a game session. And we yes. had a very hard-coded way of joining, i.e. just running the code. And you would automatically, the client would automatically try to join, right? Yes. So at some point, we need to be able to click the button and some GUI stuff happens. And maybe we type a login and we get a password from like your Ruby stuff. And eventually then we connect with the client to the server. Yeah. Well, that right. was that, that Ruby lobby chat room was right. supposed to be the authentication thing. And then ideally you would click the button in from there and that should take you right into the game session, um, you know, using some kind of JWT or whatever. Right. So in the in the the way that things are laid out here in the structure, we have uh, scenes, kind of like a Unity scene, um, but they're phaser scenes. And right. we have like a main menu scene, which we kind of yes. just flew right through. Yeah, it doesn't do anything. Game, right. Right. Yeah, it didn't do anything. Right. So I just basically stuck some stuff in there. Cool. So we stop there. Click join. Okay. Then it executes. Then it transitions to the next scene. Got right? it. Because part of the question was like, hey, like before, and we did all this phaser two stuff. At least this was my my understanding um, that from the client side of things, we did all this phaser two stuff in the past, the people who were writing the client code, like Jared and Michael and stuff. And like, hey, you know, adding buttons used to be really easy, used to be straightforward to do. And I remember you said, you know, I looked at the documentation. Oh, phaser three out, like, is so much like, better, but it, it, it has made things so complicated. Like I couldn't figure out how to draw text on the screen. Right. Phaser three. So, so, right. So I was like, well, this, when I started looking at this again, I was like, oh, I can dig into something um, like on the server side and kind of scratch my head for a bit. Or maybe I'll do something quote unquote 
easy. Um, Cause in my case, like I wrote my first GUI from scratch using triangles, like over 20 years ago now. And I've written a number does, of those. does not sound then. easy. So, mm -hmm. so like I've done this a number of times. So I'm like, you know, I don't know JavaScript. I'm pretty hacky with it, but maybe I can figure. Does anyone out really know JavaScript? Here. I mean, <laughs> I certainly don't. Certainly not the ex ES six variant, which yeah. ES lint in my GUI kept complaining because I had leftover oh, spaces in places. Um, so not exactly great when you don't know what you're doing and you're kind of messing about, right? So I spent a little bit of time cleaning up, but either way, let me um, get it up and running here. Show us Very some code, quickly. brother man. Yep. Let's do let it. Make sure, let's just see if it works. JavaScript's kind of funny because at the base level, it's kind of understandable, right? Everything's an object. Simple programming paradigm, right? And then yep. at the high level, it's like, okay, I understand, you know, this set of APIs that I can use to do stuff. But in between that is the biggest stack of shenanigans you can ever possibly imagine. I don't know. I don't even understand it that well. So <laughs> we've got shenanigans in the code, guys. <laughs> yeah. Hang on. Now I got to find my branch again because I've switched around a few times. Map, oh, main gosh. menu UI. Get check out main menu UI. All right, so in theory, if I run this thing up here, let's uh, go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, Let's but see. which one? That is always the question. Which, which one of many, many monitors? Yep. All right, let's this make is this Liberty one. Liberty Bikes thing. This sounds cool. Uh, share screen. Open let's Liberty, Liberty Bikes. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Looks like there's a to-do for you. Are you kidding? I am not kidding. Multiple advanced sharing options. Who can share? All participants. Who can start sharing? Okay. You should be good now, I hope. All right. So let's just uh, go ahead and share my empty tab. Let's see if I can find one that's empty tab and on the right desktop. Hopefully I don't have too many. I actually do have two empty tab windows floating around somewhere. I wonder which desktop it is. Okay, let's try this again. Screen share. Oh, it was desktop three and not five. Okay. All right. Five desktops. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, I'm actually finally at a point where I think I might like to have a second monitor. It's wow. been, it took me, it took me forever, but now that I'm doing a lot more like coding and I've been, I was playing with Godot over the weekend and doing stuff there. Um, oh man, you figured out how to write text on the screen. Yeah. 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 It wasn't so, so there was a really good tutorial I came across and um, what? I guess I my Google searching must just so, be awful. Okay, so it says up, down, and space to select. So in this case, like I get the text grayed out here because they're not, they don't go anywhere yet, right? Yeah. So, so in theory, we should have like a nice little state machine here and we have our first state, which is like our, our first state sometimes is like a credit or a, like an intro where like the logo comes up and a little bit of flash. And then you come to like your main menu state where like you have a bunch of buttons and like it kind of branches you off. And then you might have like your settings which might pop up like a modal dialogue type thing, or maybe it'll transition. And then credits might come up over or it might be another state with like a scrolling type thing happening. Um, but in this case, we've only got one and it's connected to the keyboard and not yet to the mouse. So if I hit space on join, here we go. And I got to turn down the music because- I can't hear it. So I guess the music doesn't go through with the share. Let me turn it on for a second to see what happens. How how loud is it for you? It's very loud for me. I can. Oh, is it is it coming through your headphones? It is coming through my. Oh, headphones. that's why we can't hear it because it's only it's coming through your through headphones. Yeah, it's that's not going right. through your mic. Uh, right. That's fair. So you'd have to take off your headphone and like put your mic into your ear okay. cup. Got it. Yeah, that's not going to work too well. <laughs> All right. So let's see if I can move around as planned. Um, are you using... know, there are such things as virtual audio cables, right? Just just throwing that out there, just putting that out there. <laughs> so so in my case, I don't have the twisty turning nice rotation. Yeah, stuff, you right? gotta merge my turning yeah, into Yeah, I gotta your merge your stuff thing. in, right? And that's probably so, gonna be a bad merge. Yeah, so um let's just stop. And so what I don't see is the green button here for some reason either. I don't know, is that still on a branch? Do we need to get all that stuff merged yeah, together? Yeah, I think. Not, yeah, the quit button is on a branch, and then my okay. turn rotation thrust branch has the quit button in it. Okay. 
Yeah, so I'm missing it basically in general, right? So let's just reopen it again. Just so we can get back to looking at what it is, right? So you should see now the join settings and credits once again. Um, Show and what me I'll do code. here, yeah, I'm going to abort here and share another screen. Now, how do I share another screen easily? You don't, you don't want to just move the code to that screen. <laughs> Would that work? That never works for me with Google Chat that we that I use all the time. Like with Google Meet, that never seems yeah. to work. Does that work for Zoom? It, I would assume so. If, yeah, you're, if you're sharing a whole screen. Let me see what happens. I'm curious to know. Inquiring minds want to know. Um, WebStorm. All right. Yeah, I see it. Oh, wow. That's awesome. It worked. All right. That's amazing. Got a little when technology works the first time. All right. So as you were saying. Button selector. Yeah. So, so okay. So I got to give a, a nod to um, the Kenny series of assets. So in this tutorial, there's this guy. I see his assets all over the place when I'm looking for game stuff. Um, Kenny.nl. And so he has a UI pack space expansion, um, which sounds very appropriately themed in this case. And the tutorial uses this glass panel and the cursor hand, right? So free game he, assets. Yeah, like and that. he does a ton of them. Um, there's opengameart.org, and he does a ton of stuff there. Space kit. So basically, he has this little, um, in, in the sprite map, there's a little hand. So right now, I'm just using the hand. And then there's like a, a box that's translucent with a border. Um, and it's squared and we just stretch it out and use it for a button, right? And then we just change the color to green when, we, when we're selecting the right one. Not Got, okay, green. so you're using just his pictures. That's right, it's, it's right it. based, right? Um, so in our preload scene, like we have this scene that kind of happens before the main scene and the main menu scene happens where we load up our background and our ship images. So like this is one of those things where Quick and dirty is just throw an image in there and get to use it. Uh, in the future, what we'd want to be doing is, you know, basically using like texture packer um, to pack sprite maps and that kind of stuff. But, you know, I don't think efficiency is not necessarily our our main purpose here at the moment. <laughs> um, so, you don't so say. I, so I knocked out the uh, the client initialization. So basically, we we create a new AMQP client on the broker endpoint using the game model. But then in this case, we're no longer doing asynchronous initialization. Instead, not in this, yeah, not in the preload of this scene. Right. So basically then we go to the menu scene, which is our main menu. Right. Um, and in here we create an array for our buttons and we have a button selector, which is going to be an image. Um, and then we have a selected button index. So essentially we have an array of three items. We're currently on one of those three. And as you move your keys up and down, it just changes your index. And it changes it. when it gets highlighted green. Yeah. Um, and up here is the link for the tutorial. Okay. Um, That's cool. So basically, like literally, I just lifted the code and put it in the right places um, and then cleaned it up a little bit to fit our structure a little bit better, right? Yeah. So there's like select button. And you can see when you select button, you say set Tense the current the selected current button, button yeah. to white. And then set the newly select. So then you get the new button, right? Based on the index that's being handed in that you're selecting. And then you set the tint for that to green, which is the code for green right there, right? And then separately, then it moves the hand icon up and down. So, so what's interesting is that that I found about phaser. Um, so phaser two, I'm assuming based upon the conversations previously, had like this nice like kind of UI thing that could get up and running really quickly. Maybe it might not have been like production ready to go into your game as a final thing. But you know, like a button is a pretty basic thing you want to use, like pretty much out of the gate, right? Um, for doing stuff visual. But like we're back here to, like this is kind of the same type of stuff that I was doing, you know, 20 years ago to build my button class out of triangles. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. let's draw a square. We're going to put the text on it. We're going to change the color. We're going to watch where our keys go. We're going to count our indices. Then we're going to flip stuff around and then we're going to redraw it, right? Um, so like 
basically like this tutorial just basically went through those basic steps using phaser three. So like we have to select next button and you know, you're iterating through, you make sure you don't go past your length of your array, all that kind of stuff. You know, you don't want to blow yourself up. Um, at least in native land, you'd blow yourself up. You might get away with it in JavaScript maybe. Yeah. Um, and then in the confirm selection, like if you look in the console log of your browser, like it emits a selected event and we log like where we are and what we're doing, that kind of thing. So we grab the currently selected button, we emit the selected event, and then we say, well, hey, this is really hacky. If zero is the selected button index, because I know that join is my first button in, in our array, then go ahead and initialize the client and start main scene and then pass through the data objects that we want to be keeping track of to utilize in other scenes that are going to be shared, which is our client for MQP, and then the game model itself where the data is going to be kept, right? Um, so then if you look at, like, how does all this stuff get created? Like I said- So you're not, um, I notice you're not doing the A weight on the init. No, so we're not basically asynchronous. So we can't do the A weight because confirmed selection is not asynchronous. Oh, I got you, okay. Right? And I wasn't sure like if that was going to blow it up or not. Um, so, cause I like, like I literally just got this to work a little while ago. So we probably want to do that at some point. Um, but for now we have our basic, like here's the play button. You add an image, you set its size. The texture is this glass panel that came from Kenny's work. We set the size of pixels on the screen. So one of the other things here that, we, that we're completely ignoring from a GUI point of view is that we're talking about pixels, right? We're not talking about points. We're not talking about like percentages of your screen. So like I'm, we're assuming like 1920 by 1080, if somebody was on a mobile device or if they had a smaller screen, like the results are not gonna be correct, right? Um, they're correct for me, but they're probably not gonna be correct for somebody who runs like a 4K display or anything like that, right? Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of calculations between percentages and points and pixels and stuff that goes on to scale your displays and stuff and to make sure all your GUI parts get put where they're supposed to be. So we're ignoring all of that stuff. We're just sticking an image up there. We're putting some text on it. Um, so this play button that we created, we push it onto the array. And then we're saying on play button selected, log join message in the console. And like I said, up above, we actually handle on the confirm that we actually execute and go to the main scene itself, right? So it's actually a surprisingly lot of like low level work to do buttons at the moment um, that, I, that I wouldn't have expected, I guess, because Phaser was in version two. And for some reason they decided in version three, it wasn't gonna be part of the core offering of the library, right? So, I mean, maybe there's maybe there's a bunch of great, awesome community GUI libraries for Phaser now. Maybe that was the idea, was to spin off the responsibility out of the core, right? Like that could, that could make sense. Um, so yeah, and then basically after that point in time, really once you get to the main scene at this point, it's basically exactly like it was, right? So. So ideally what you would have, you'd either have like a, another party, third party library, open source, the plugs into phaser 3D, and you can just call and say, create me a button here, right? And we would do that again in the main scene. And we'd have like the lead button up in the corner, or maybe when you, we'd, uh, you know, we'd look for the escape key being pressed. When the escape key was pressed, a little GUI would pop up, like this is our quit menu. And then you can either set your settings. It goes on, you yeah, know, if it was a yeah. single player to go on. Are you sure you want to quit? Kind of yeah, thing. yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so yeah, very much like baby steps, learning how to crawl, create like the basic button kind of thing and look for better options at this point. So I have, I have found many, uh, many references to in phaser three, like use a container to hold your, um, you know, to hold your whatever kind of thing, but uh, no yeah, actual example, going, right? no actual example of doing. 
Yeah, because like in um, in Godot, right? When we were doing the pod escape thing, and I don't know if you you were using Godot this weekend to do some work, right? Yeah. Um, Godot has this really nice GUI facility where you can create a certain type of container, like there's one called vertical layout, and you can set the spacing of your items and just keep throwing things in there, and then it automatically spaces them out. And then you can group them so that when you move your container, everything nicely moves around with the container as you would expect as a group, right? And so you can build these relatively complex um, hierarchies of GUI elements that operate nicely together and move together as you would expect, rather than having to be like, well, how many pixels do I need to move to the right if my parent moves? Like I assume under the hood, like there's matrix transformations that go on from parent to child and the transformations get executed down through the matrices and all the transforms get set appropriately, right? But it's really nice to have that facility there because Godot of course has the GUI itself. So you can like drag and drop your pieces and you can hook them up to your code. And so it's a, it's a different environment to develop in. Whereas in here we were like, hey, let's load an image. Let's turn it green. Let's put some text on it. So I guess it all right. depends on if, you know, if you're a really fast typer and you know your library really well, you can be more efficient than, than you can be with a GUI sometimes, right? But if you don't know what you're doing, like jumping into Godot would probably be a little bit easier. Oh, look, it's that GUI thing. Let me drag and drop that thing over here. It's like, yeah, I really like that draggy droppy thing. Like that works easier when you don't know what you're doing, right? Which when I started doing Godot, I didn't know what I was doing either. So everybody starts there at some point. Yeah. Quick progress update. So I actually have the server building successfully Ooh, in mm -hmm. WCL2, and I have the client running successfully in WCL2, but the server crashes on connection with the memory error. Oh, interesting. So yeah. Connection to the message broker? Um, I don't know. It's giving me a, a 139, which is the memory exit error access violation. So you, something in the C++ code is having a fit. Are you running the broker? Yeah. OK. Just, just trying to make sure. Because there may be a seg fault if it can't contact the broker at the moment. I'm just actually going to uh, shut down my broker and find out. I was just about to do the same thing I, on I my think, end. I think that's an old bug that's been lying around for a while. It might be that I don't have the ports networking set. Because there's no networking in our Docker files right now. We didn't like you know do all that, and I probably should. but it might be that I don't have that network and ports properly opened. And so it can't talk to the broker, even if it is running. Yeah. I would bet a hundred dollars that that's the problem. You know, it's it's probably one it. of those cases where the happy path is okay, but the unhappy path is very unhappy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Got to work on that. More accessible debugging. So what was your, um, oh, so are we, I'm going to merge damping and floaty uh, okay. into master because too bad. Uh, oh, yeah, yep. it, uh, it qu quickly. So sender on error, proton error. Currently, well, it currently exits one for me if it can't make a connection, which is not really a great thing to do either. You think like, hey, back off and retry might be a good strategy rather than like <laughs> exploding. Right? It's fine. It's shippable. That's the important thing. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna share my screen again and we're gonna try and do some live coding here. Share screen. Oh, Although okay. truly though, I do think that since I've been working at Red Hat and more, more on infrastructure than games, I think, I think in games as a developer, my certainly as an indie developer, I think being focused on the happy path when you're trying to prioritize your hours of development working on the happy path and looking for the fun is very important and the error path and the stuff that goes wrong is less so because hey they can always restart it but like you know the stuff we work on here like you can't always restart it you don't you can't restart your cluster very easily these days if it's in a data center and people may not even be allowed to go into the data center at this point right so like uptime and slas and slos and all that stuff is a lot more important in the enterprise world than, you know, when you're developing an indie game for mobile. Uh, Roddy, is your um, my gosh, menu stuff, is that in a branch already? It's in main menu UI branch, but only in my repo. 
Mm. So if you've got a remote added for my repo, you can put in. I uh, probably don't. You're not even listed as a fork. Oh, right, because because it originated in my repo. Oh. So I didn't have the fork back, right? Well, that's lame. So um, because it got imported from my... Main menu UI. All right, so let's see. Code, copy, get remote add Roddy. Remote Roddy already exists. Look, oh, at, that. look at that. Get Amazing. Branch. Get I think you might have done this before. Check out Roddy main menu UI. Get merge master. Didn't blow up. Good step. Now run and see what happens. Dude, getting greedy over there. Uh, let's see. Run the server. Um, I don't need to run it that fast. Debug level one quarter second. what it was building. OK. Um, hey, look. Oh, and I can't use the mouse, but that's nope. fine. No um, mouse clicking so stuff. So we're going to go to this, and we're going to do join. Oh, space bar. Yeah. But it didn't actually join. Did you set the IP once you merged the code? Mm, the that's a good question. Yeah, it's it connected. Okay. But I didn't get any join. You got the join message. Uh, and by message, I mean on the console log. Yeah, but it didn't actually, the server has not heard from it. Oh, That's weird. Oh, so now, now it's working. Even though you're, you've reloaded it? Yeah. That is weird. Yeah, as it's very freshly baked, there could definitely be bugs. <laughs> so let's close this. Let's stop the server. I want to double check that my damping is in there. Yeah, OK. So we'll restart the server first for giggles. All right, now we'll start a client. So yeah, the client is joining the game before you actually hit the join button. So something, something is amiss with your code, sir. Yes, it certainly could be. All right, so let's close all these and we'll see if we can fix this real quick. Um, so preload scene, that's where, oh, the preload scene still has the client in it, in it on my side. Oh, that's why. Aha, I love an easy fix. All right, I gotta stop the server. Restart the server. Hopefully that's an easy fix. All right, uh, hard refresh. Hey, look at that, it did not join yet. And now if we join. It does not join. Doesn't join at all. Interesting. So. This Very client net. So that should be when we get into the main scene. Uh, where did you, or where would you have initiated the client? Um, in the 
main menu rather than the it used to be in the preload and then the init gets called hang on let me pop, open the source again i'm just looking at something else there i'm not then, seeing a client init anywhere actually <laughs> at least not in the committed code in the in your remote did i not commit it Maybe that was the last thing I was doing and didn't get committed. Yeah, yeah. So the client init never made it into any code anywhere. So I'm assuming okay. so once I, we get into the main scene in right. the constructor, we need yeah. to init. Yeah. The so basically, in confirm selection, there should be an if block around. So after button dot emit selected. Do you want to just push it? Uh, yeah, I can do that too. Well, because uh, it can't just be around confirm selected because it would need to be if they selected the specific button. Yeah, and confirm selected gets called if that gets selected. Well, maybe that's the issue. I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> yeah, because my stuff, yeah, my stuff was pushed. So maybe in the, some cases, the confirm selected doesn't get called. And in which case, just pop yours up. So you're so what I'm saying is the 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 client dot init does not appear anywhere in the code in your branch. So oh, because it's committed but not pushed. Right. <laughs> Never mind. Only slightly brain dead. It's okay. <laughs> it is Wednesday. It's been a long week. Wednesday, my dudes. Yeah. Let me know. What do you know? You... There was a bunch of stuff that pushed. Wow. What a surprise. Right. So I need to pull git pull Roddy main menu UI. Your local following changes would be overwritten by merge. Please stash. Git reset hard head. Uh, I don't know what I just did, but we're going to do this anyway. Conflict in preload scene. Okay. What did we both change? Uh, I didn't change anything. I reset hard to head. Oh. This client new, this client init, that's the current change. I want the incoming change, which is where you, there we go. Aha, okay, so it's where you create the new client. And then I'm assuming in the main scene, you maybe actually init the client. In the main, in the menu scene, when the button is selected. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. The if client. they if they click the zero button, init the yeah, client, and exactly. then start the main scene. Got it. Okay, right. this looks like it'll work. NPM serve. Because in theory, if you don't connect, you don't necessarily want to get yourself into the game. Start. <laughs> Maybe someday I'll get that right. All right. Server still running. Hasn't exploded. Always good. Join. Still nothing. Still nothing. Did you rerun your NPM start? Yes. Yeah. So here's the. Here's the code. Yeah, maybe confirm selection doesn't get called or something silly. All right. Starting what browser are you in? Chrome. OK, I'm in Firefox. Well, I can do this because I don't care about the server at the moment. But the interesting thing, though, is that you do switch to the um, you do switch to yeah. The I mean, state, it says right? it says it's doing the init, and then, then here the WebSocket connection failed, oh. so that's fine. Um, so let me maybe it was just the server was not actually happy. So let's try again. One more time. And the broker is up because it doesn't connect directly to the server, right? Right.
So you want to check the broker? It's not. Or check the console. Because like it's it not looks doing, like, not doing its thing. I mean, it, it right? sent the init. There's the init. But it says the connection fails. Oh, because the IP is different. Damn it. Oh, biscuits. Biscuits and gravy. If only we had some kind of config file that wasn't in source control. If only. But this is something I'm kind of working through now is making this a little more portable so I don't have to hack so much stuff locally. Uh, and adding a Docker Compose okay. YAML file. To so the server blew up with an error that the UUID that was sent was not. Empty. Yeah. So why is that? Here's our UUID. And it goes into the model. So then the where, did, where is, did we use it before? Here's so there's a UUID there. There's a constructor. Oh, you're not actually passing it the UUID when you build the AMQP client. I don't know how yours works at all. But it passes the model and the UUID is in the model. Uh, right, but the AMQP client doesn't use the UUID from the model. Oh, well, the right fix is to change it to use it from the model. What? If the model is the master for, like the model is the game state, right? So the player's game state Not is in the model. It's a model view controller kind of setup, right? So your data goes in the model. Um, sure, we can do that. I don't know that, that we want to do that. Hold on, I have to look through the code and think about that. Because this client's model is that the whole game or is that just because if it already knows about the model there's no reason not to ah uh, so here's here's the here's the difference right the model holds the entirety of the game state including the player's array the model doesn't know who you are Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, I know what you're saying. So we have to tell the client who we are, even though we're passing in the model, which holds everybody. Everybody, gotcha. So we still need that. We just needed to actually pass the UUID. I don't I, like, oh. I, I legitimately don't understand how your code works at all for you without exploding. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm going to look, take a look here now and see if that's what I'm doing to see if I wiped it out by accident. I mean, it's no, literally like the, so the code in the preload scene, it says this dot client is new AMQP game client config dot broker endpoint and comma this dot model. And like that's code that I haven't touched. Like it's been that way. As far as I'm aware, I haven't. What, whatever, code. whatever code is in your repo on GitHub, legitimately was missing. The UUID. The UUID. Yep. So I I don't know how your yours worked when you ran it locally, but wow, that that moves really fast. Pew pew. So it's working now. So that's cool. Uh, we got in through the menu. Okay, we have okay. our quit button. And if I click the quit button, it quits. 
Hooray. Oh, and on the server cool. side, we see a security leave command that the player has quit. Hooray. So we've got round trip. Progress. Almost. Yeah. The only thing we couldn't figure out is like there, there is a, um, supposedly there's a way to intercept when the user closes the browser tab. Um, couldn't, I couldn't figure that one out. I couldn't make it work. Because ideally, if they close the browser tab, they should also quit the game. Correct. Uh, and I couldn't figure out how to make that uh, do the right thing. But anyway, so your code is working. Um, oh, I'm in a detached head state. Get check out dash B. Uh, main, what'd you call it? Main menu UI? Main menu UI, yeah. Camel case. All right, I don't yeah. need the console log in it. And in the main in the menu scene, JavaScript, one of the things got add that got added in from the tutorial was um, a line that says this dot events dot once phaser scenes events shut down, and then it has like a lambda function. So I wonder I don't actually what does that understand. shut down refer to? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what you were talking about. All right, so here's Red Hat Game Dev SRT. I'm just going to create a PR to merge it into master because it sounds fine to me. And I've got my little fix for the UID. Squash and merge. Off we go. All right, done. Look at that, progress. Space rings thing. <laughs> Apparently, I have I have made a typo. Um, I could check Git blame on that one. Uh, let's see. So next, I really want to get some text. So uh, where was that thing? Um, game objects text. So we're just gonna screw things up right here for now. Um, let's see what happens when I add this to the main scene, main scene. Okay, here's where we add the star field, where we add the sprite, player group, physics add group, keyboard, what is the player group? Player physics groups. And the player group is a null. Client model, tile sprite, quit button, music, player group, where we add a group. We add a physics group to the player group. Got it. Main game loop, when we get a player, That's not a container. OK, so I'm just going to try stupid stuff right now to figure things out. So we're going to add text for giggles. I should probably check out master git origin master git check out the player text. OK, so I've added text. NPM start, son of a biscuit. All right, what happens? And of course, it's in the wrong browser window. <laughs> All right, join. Hello world, look, there it is. So I figured out how to add text. So next, what we want to do is that's at zero, zero. Oh, there was, it talked about doing it in the center of the screen. It was like divide by two or something. Well, I don't actually care because it's in the right place. So the, the documentation that I had found said, here's the page, um, use a container 
and then add the text to the container. Um, so we need the player and the text to be in a container. New container. The scene to which it belongs. Children. An array of game objects to add to the container. OK, that's cool. How do we add objects after the fact to the container? Members. Oh, but it's just going to be an array. All right. Mild interruption. I got it working on Windows, running hey. within WSL2. Do you want to show that off? Everything is good to go. I, I don't have a ship, but I have connection to the yeah. menu scene. I got connection to the broker, all that other stuff. And I do That's have good. a Docker Compose file. So cool. That I can show cool. up PR. That's good. <laughs> do you want, yeah, I mean, you could share your screen and show it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me move all of this over to a monitor that you'll be able to see it on. That's the secret. So, Eric, you said you've only moved to two monitors recently? No, I, I haven't even. Oh, you I, haven't I'm finally even... at a point where I think I would like a second monitor. I don't know how you've gotten by. I don't code. Like, how big, how big is your monitor? Is it like one of these 43 inch ones and you put it on? Your... No, it's a 27. Yes, no? Okay. It's not it's not that super monstrous. Is it is it just a coder thing that people need? Yeah, I'm monitor? I'm starting to code more heavily, and it would be nice to have like Godot editor on one page and VS Code somewhere else. And like I've been slowly, incrementally growing, right? Like over over the course of years. Like I started <laughs> out like with like I don't know, 19 inch monitor, and then I moved to like a 24, and then I moved to another 24. And then I moved to another 24 <laughs> and just like within the last two years, I added a fourth. Um, and then my there's perfect, the laptop screen, right? Yeah. My perfect setup is uh, I have an ultra wide, which is usually for documentation or whatever it is I'm working on, be able to move stuff around where I want yeah. to. And then I have a vertical 24 inch code monitor, which is an IPS screen. Yep. And yeah, you know, that's where all my code goes. And then I have the laptop screen, or sometimes I'll use like a cell phone or a tablet or something. But that's for Slack or messaging or whatever, just so I can right. chat with people without interrupting what I'm doing. But so what I've got here on my screen, if you can if you can see this, is okay. I actually have it running localhost uh, inside WCL2, and you can see here in the the de debug console, it's actually it's got the keys, it's got the identity, it's connected, and everything. Um, and so what I had to do there is it's pointed to uh, localhost 5672, and I had to go in and manually add a Windows firewall entry for okay, WSL2 for it. Yep. Uh, yeah, some fun PowerShell scripting there to just open that port, because for whatever reason, WSL2, like as an app, doesn't have any of the Windows firewall API built in. Like Microsoft just, and there's a giant set of issues on it on GitHub for WSL2. Microsoft just doesn't include the firewall prompt for any ports you try to open in WCL2. And I don't know what the blocker is to doing it. I'm assuming it's because the network translation layer is so low level, they have to probably write a ton of code to get yeah, that stuff work. to play nicely. Um, but yeah, I mean, here it is. It's working. It's connected. I don't have the ship, you know, appearing or moving around yet. But, you know, everything else, all the assets load and everything. And uh, let me actually drag over the windows terminal here so you can kind of see what this looks like um so i actually have the artemis cloud uh item broker running and then the game server here and this is in wcl2 and then same thing with the client uh, running from wcl2 and so both of those are getting served from linux uh but are you know running the client is running in a web browser in a windows environment Perfect. Cross-platform already. Yeah. And in order to get that all running, it was just a, a bit of a simple Docker Compose setup here um, and a couple of minor tweaks to the Docker file. But I'm just using the uh, Docker networking 
automated link system. So I can give Artemis Cloud the you know DNS entry Artemis Cloud and Docker networking takes care of all the rest of it. So I don't have to worry about copying IP addresses around or building my own network or anything like that. It just, it all just works. It's nice when that actually happens. <laughs> it's very rare as well, right? <laughs> it is. <laughs> so many places where screen. a little hole can catch your toe and you can trip. Yeah. So let me get all of these changes staged and make sure I'm not breaking any of y'all's stuff. And then I'll get a pull request up. Cool. So trying to figure out text. <laughs> Where do I draw the player sprite? So Derek, do you find it easier to use Linux through Windows or use Windows through Linux? Oh my God, what a, what a <laughs> terrible, terrible, awful, <laughs> evil question. <laughs> Um, with the disclaimer that Windows drives me up a wall for a lot of different reasons, mostly around the lines of it's not open source, so I can't fix stuff when it breaks. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's a lot of legacy business decisions. So in, in Linux, there's a lot of stupid legacy decisions, but you have the source code to go figure out why. And Windows, like you get to the end of the Google pile and it's some developer commenting from 1998. This is the way we've always done it since Windows, you know, 95. 3.1 or something. Yeah. <laughs> or 3.1 or something. <laughs> and it's like, it's 2021. What do you mean this is how we've always done it? Someone yeah. should have and that Croft has now. been sitting there for like 25 years or something. Right? Yeah. And, and nothing against Microsoft. Like they've done incredible, amazing things on top of like having to support literally right. three decades yeah, of enterprise customers that like if you change a single thing they have a conniption fit yep. um but yeah, no it's just stack of complexity for sure yeah and you don't want to run that cruft like on top of linux like linux you know it, it has its issues but in most cases like it's pretty clean and in the cases where it's not you kind of can research why yep. and doing it the other way around where most of the primary paths for windows are still incredibly optimized even though it's there's all this cruft in there running Linux is kind of that simple layer on top of that is, is much, much easier. That being said, if NVIDIA and AMD are able to put more resources towards the Linux drivers and the open source drivers and get that to a point where it's pretty easy to clean out most of those edge cases and get graphics, graphical applications like games running in a Linux environment without any troubleshooting, I will drop Windows in a heartbeat. Yeah. And that's just because it, it is crafty, there. right? There's a lot going on and troubleshooting and debugging it is a nightmare yeah. versus, you know, Linux. At the end of the day, if I get frustrated enough, I go grab a box. I build everything from source. That's and right. at the you point where exactly you run into what, yeah. problems, right? Like I just right. debug it. Yeah. And, yeah. I think, you know, uh, sometimes that means the upstream contributions are happening. But honestly, like that's the way it should be. You know, we should be removing all of this developer friction. If you have something break, you should be able to, if you're an engineer, right? If you're a programmer, you should be able, be to, able to fix it. And fix it. That's right. Yeah, I've been very happy to see all the strides AMD has been moving toward with their GPU open stuff, right? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, in the last couple of years, they've open sourced a ton of stuff. Um, I don't know that they're there on all fronts, but certainly I think their approach, you know, is, is correct at least. Absolutely. And we're kind of, as time goes on, we're kind of seeing, you know, Red Hat's whole value proposition of we swear open source is, you know, it's the better way to do business, right? It's eclipsed proprietary software in terms of velocity, even with the difficulties in communication and maintainership and all of the, you know, issues that are endemic to an open source community. At the end of the day, you still have the source code. And so at the end of the day, you can still get what you need to do done and you're not, you know, blocked by anyone but your right. own time and effort. Still trying to figure out text. Where's, where's text the is actually, text? text is more tricky than you might think from a rendering point of view. Well, it's it not. Just, so the, the challenge isn't the rendering. The challenge is the, the relationships between, between, the, between objects. the objects. Yeah. I yeah. had the same and problem so you, earlier. Yeah. And so it's like, you can't, 
add a child to something anymore you you have to add like a um um you have to put stuff in a container basically and so i'm trying to figure out how to construct a container that holds Text plus. the physics object and yeah. the thing but to do it in a way that works with a, it's like a major overhaul sadly to change yeah. to have a container of physics groups and not the physics groups so i'm just like believe it or not yesterday when i was teaching uh, programming to a friend um i was actually going over like what is a scene graph and you know why would you want to build that and why do you have different nodes and why do you have a node with a transformation that's just 2d for the screen for your hud versus a node that's the 3d you know reprojection that is your game world and how that scales out and relates and like here's the math that goes on behind the scenes to do both of those transformations and then render them in the right order it's not easy stuff like it, the presentation that i was going to show him like i read through it and i was like I struggle understanding this and I know what it's saying. <laughs> it's like a white paper sort of thing. And it's like the concept isn't actually that difficult, but the language a lot around of it is. That's right. Yeah. And the language is, is, especially if you don't deal with that language every day, right? You go it's, back it's to obscene. it. It's like, obscene. Yeah. It's challenging. And if I'm not, honestly, like I'm not a, a very mathy type person, I, but like if I'm not using it every single day and I'm sitting here looking at me. literally slides and slides of equations, it takes me like 10 minutes to look at each one and go, right, that's what's happening. It's like a light but, to go on. Yeah. And like, <laughs> granted, long. if I am working in this stuff every single day, like when I was writing a renderer, you know, like seven, eight years yep. ago, it was way easier. Like I would look at it and be like, oh, I know what this equation is doing. I know yep. what it's saying. It's super easy, but it's, man, it's not like riding a bike. <laughs> no. Long-term information retrieval, right? Yeah. In cold storage. <laughs> it's not even a hard drive, man. It's like tape oh, up there or yeah. something like that. <laughs> not near line at all. So yeah, to kind of come around to what you were talking about with like text and, and rendering systems and stuff, like I was looking into uh, what is out there, like what's standard in the industry right now, because scale forms deprecated, like using flash for any sort of UI drawing, like you would have seen, you know, back in the day in crisis or something like that, yeah. or 99% of all the other games is it's not supported. Like that product is gone. And so I was looking around there, like, what are the competing products that everyone's just like, oh, we just use the built-in Unity or Unreal stuff. And I'm like, that's not... <laughs> that's, that's definitely not a downgrade in comparison, right? Like the scale form stuff was a pain, but it was really powerful. Yeah. So it turns out there actually is a company out there that is solving the problem besides me. Epic shout out to my tiny one-man project for you know, writing game GUIs or whatever. But uh, yeah, there's there's really not too many other people in that space that are kind of doing those sorts of things. So so do you have an open source project started or are you just trying to solve it for like a game of directly? So the open source project that I have is just literally like an example project of, hey, grab these like seven things and stick them together and it works. And all it is is basically a renderer for WebKit that okay. renders to the GPU, right? It's the same thing that EA uses internally, um, except I think they do all of their rendering on the CPU and that's expensive. So translating yeah. those most, as many calls as possible uh, to the GPU is better. And in fact, Mozilla has an experimental Firefox renderer that does everything with Rust on the GPU. And it's very good. But it also is like, I did like a week's worth of work to see if I could get it running in a game engine. And right. there's so, so there's slow. probably six months worth of work there. Yeah. You know, for a single programmer. It. Yeah. Yeah. Now, would it be worth it to do that? Absolutely. I, if somebody wants to pay me to do that. But, <laughs> but you know, right now, yeah, it's one of those things where, yeah, it's it needs, you know, a bulk of rendering engineers to jump in on the problem to solve it quickly. So I can add a sprite to a container. Still working on text over here. Just add, can I 
I make that a physics group? Player group is a physics group. Hmm. So I'm looking through, uh, I guess I'll share my screen again. Actually, we're getting close to time here. Let's see, share my screen, this screen. All right, so Here's an example in the phaser documentation for adding sprites to a container. And so they create a container, they create some sprites, and then they container add sprites to it. Okay, so let's try to do that. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna do this on the main, on the menu scene because then I don't have to keep going into the other scene. All right, oh, I don't need working tree, menu scene. Where's the beginning? Here's the init. I guess I want init. No, I want create, yeah. I think, yeah, okay. So we have a container and then we're gonna try to do a physics group, physics add group, which is where we then add a create of the sprite in that physics group. You know, I honestly don't even know if we need physics groups because we're not using, oh, but we may need them for angles and stuff like for set rotation and setting. Anyway, so Player group is a physics group create. Okay, so we're gonna have a physics group and then we're going to create a sprite in it. So we have var phys group equals this add physics no this physics add group this physics add group, I think this physics add group, this physics add group, oh, collide world bounds, true. Actually, I don't think we want to collide with the world bounds. So we'll just try that for now. And I'm sure this linting error is, yeah, that's what I thought, trailing space is not allowed, fine. Okay, then we want to create the sprite like we did before. Our uh, sprite equals this phys group. This is just proof of concept to try and get something to show up on the screen. Our sprite equals this phys group create a ship. Okay. So I think, oh, and then I have to add the physics group to the container, container, add phys group, maybe? Container add, oh, it has to be an array of one, which is fine. Oh Lord, why are, why is the bracket key like the hardest key? Fizz group is not in camel case. I I don't care. Why does it need to be in camel case? <laughs> do, do they all need to be in camel case? Uh, all Very right, opinionated so, linter. Let's see. Yeah, seriously, right? Okay. Cannot read property create of undefined. Lovely. Menu scene JS 154. 154. This stuff. Oh, it's because it's not this stuff. It's just this group. X is not defined. It's because it's not. You don't say. 
You <laughs> really now. Child will render is not a function. That is pretty awful. <laughs> we may we may have hit the wall here. Um, well, let's see if we can not add the physics group to the container and see what happens. Okay, interesting. So we have our ship on the screen, which is good, but we can't add the ship to the container. Maybe containers can't hold physics groups. This adds Sprite. Did we add a Sprite or did we create a Sprite? Oh. Hmm. I mean, I prefer 7-Up, but you know. Uh, yeah, well, you can't <laughs> always get what we want. Can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes. Okay, the physics group. I can see Roddy singing along in his head. <laughs> <laughs> we go through an equal amount of 7-Up and Sprite here. Mm -hmm. We don't discriminate. <laughs> Or a multiple sugary fizzy beverage group yes. here. All right, well, let's try a different tactic here. And instead of doing a physics group, let's just do the example that they have in the examples and see if we can work backwards from there. So bar. What does that get us, if anything? All right, so that gets us our Sprite, which is weird that it displays it before it's in the container, but I guess. Uh, container add. Container add a Sprite. Okay, interesting. So it worked. It, it's now for some reason in a in a different place. <laughs> um, so let's do All right, that's cool. It's still in a different place. So now we want to do texts. I had text up somewhere. Where was text? Text. That doesn't look like a font. Press start 2P. I guess it could be a font. The font name must be quoted. Do I need a font name? I would assume you'd have a default. We're, we're about to find out. Yeah, they've written the library, I mean, for a web browser. <laughs> There's no way there's not a default. Yeah, because in some of the other sections um, where the text is used, the font is not specified. All right, so here's the hello world text. Mm -hmm. So now if I add some text to the container, they should be yay on top of one hey, another. There you go. All right, so now the question is, how do I add the physics group sprite <laughs> to the container because it totally was pissed off and didn't like that at all. So basically we're, we're using a physics group and we're creating a air quotes, a sprite in the physics group. And then we manipulate the bot, which gives you a body basically, right? So we create the physics group body thing and we put it into an array of all the player physics groups. Then we set the rotation on the body. Then we set the angle on the body. Hey, that that's great, right? So 
if we look at um, physics archaic group, it's a way to collect objects. But if we look at container, a container says it can contains other objects. So I don't, it will be removed from the display list and added to the container's own internal list. That's fine. Position of the game object becomes relative to the position of the container. Um, that's fine. So I don't understand why when we had the um, physics group, why we couldn't add a physics group to a container. Let's see, phaser physics group container. Uh, add a physics group container, container by, hey, look at that. Hey, look, there you go. All right. You can't do it. Phase groups doesn't have body. But you can use set all to set properties to all sprites. Oh. Yeah, that was my fear. So what I think we're actually going to have to do is draw the text in the same place <laughs> and then update the text for um, for the, update the position of the text, unfortunately. Yeah, and I mean, it's a HUD item, right? So that's not unheard of in game development where you have to, you know, translate a point in 3D space, or in this case, right, it's 2D space from one worldview to another. That is, that's a simple matrix transformation, right? It's just down to the, you know, the library you're using, how simple that makes it. Quit button player physics group. So that's an array of all of the player physics groups. So I think we're gonna need like a HUD array to hold all of the we're gonna try it, whether or not we need it. Okay, so now when we're creating that, let's try this. This player, no, HUD array player UID equals this add text. Oh God. X, Y. Hello world. No. Player UID, which is text. Oh God, here we go. Oh, but I need a player at that point. Damn it. Which means I need the server. Oh man, this just gets more and more complicated all the time. See, we really need a debug mode where we don't need the server <laughs> to have a player. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. All right, I'll try to refresh this again. Join. Ah! Look at that. We had a thing. Beautiful. Wow. Oh, amazing. What happens Excellent. when I. Oh, look at this. Okay, but it's going to stay in the same place. Right? The position doesn't get updated. Right. Okay. Yeah. So now I have to figure out how to update the position of the text, which I'm sure is just like a set whatever. What are you? You're a game object. Do you not have like a set something, set position, new text? How do I just set your members active, alpha, bottom left, bottom right, top left, top right, angle, auto round, blend mode, body. Camera filter, canvas, context, data. Jeez, come on. Depth, <laughs> dirty, display height. Oh no, server crashed. <laughs> display origin. The... Nope. Display width, flip X, flip Y, frame height. 
Oh, and Chuck, is, oh, so many things. I want to like put you in a place. Scale, scroll. Oh Lord. Texture type X and Y. The Y position. Are you settable, or are you just accessible? Methods. Oh, son of a. You would think. All right. Set. Set, 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 flip, set font, set line, set origin, scale. What do I do with the, position? I just set the position. Ah, set X and set Y, okay. Set W, set X and set Y, hooray, okay, here we go. So in the update loop, we will player sprite. So this is going to be const player HUD equals this HUD array player UUID. So that grabs the player HUD sprite thing. And server X, server Y, lerp X, lerp Y. So you know what? We're going to do something dumb. And we're going to go player HUD set X, lerp X, because why the hell not? Player HUD set Y, lerp Y. And we're going to wait for the magic to happen. You ready for the magic? Oh, yeah. It's nothing like uh, the pressure of doing it live. By the way, if anybody is paying attention to the chat, it's not me. Uh, it's just Roddy paying attention to the chat. OK. So let's refresh you. Uh, server. Join. Hey. Hey, there we go. Look at that. Yay, I'm being followed. <laughs> Heck okay, yeah. so now what I want to do is I want to grab just the last five characters of the UUID. So how do I substring the last five of a string in JavaScript? Substring method. Thanks, W3 Ski Schools. <laughs> one to four. I usually add MDN to my searches because W3 schools is sometimes absolutely crazy. But in this case, it's right. All right. So we want, oh, oh boy. Computer meltdown? No. Yes. Computer meltdown. All right. I need to stop you. Um, so we want JavaScript string length. So I would I would just use slice and then what is it? you want the last what five right uh yeah yeah but I need to know what the length is uh so you do uh so it would be string length dot and slice minus five. and then in yeah. parentheses yeah string dot length minus five yeah yeah. yeah. So this is going to be, um, where's the text? How do I this add text player UID? So we're going to do const short, short, oh boy. Short player UUID equals player UUID slice. Yep. Or is it? Stir one, yeah. Okay. One thing to note: um, substring uh -huh. is kind of terrible support-wise, but latest Chrome it will always be the fastest. I don't think we should use it right now because it's still, I don't think, best practice. But five years from now, substring will be better and more standard. Maybe. You, you know, you don't. You don't need a second argument. Oh, that makes sense. There you go. All 
I don't know why the server keeps crashing. Weird. Segmentation fault. Right, I'm going to need you to fix that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought we fixed the one with the heartbeat issue in the very beginning, right? I think I thought that problem went away. It's like a different problem. It runs here, but I'm I'm running the debug mode, so maybe there's. A hey. Problem. Hey, there you go. CF two any six thirty three. Cool. All right, now I know how to have text. Okay, so um, I'm gonna. Oh, that's fine. I don't mind stopping share because we need to end the stream. I'm going to push this as a branch, as a like kind of a work in progress. Um, and so we should also add like the velocity and some of the other information. Um, yep. Yeah, and I think um, I just found that I am GUI has a JavaScript. Um, implementation. Uh, AM GUI is like a really awesome uh, native C library, like a really immediate mode, really easy to use for like building quick and dirty GUIs for doing debugging stuff. Okay. So it'd be really cool to connect this to our configuration. So then we could have our values listed and then you could go in and like grab a slider and like modify it on the fly. Right. So when you're trying to like test, does this feel good? Does it not feel good? Like that'd be a really great way to do it. Wouldn't even have to restart the server to do the settings, anything of that nature, right? We just do it all like right there on the screen. We get like a little uh, input mechanism where we tap a key and it brings up our little debug menu. And then we got our little sliders and our input values. Um, yeah. Right. And then we can, you know, more quickly tweak things. Um, and then, like you said, once you can see them on the ship, you can tweak them with a little debug window. And then obviously, like you can do that whole round trip of, does this feel good? Does it not feel good? Does it play well? A whole lot quicker. Yeah, so ch basically changing the settings from within the DUI kind yep. of thing. At runtime. Yeah, that'd be cool. It'd still be nice to not need the server and to just have some debug mode for the client that lets it just do things, but that, that might take some more engineering. Yes. Cool. We made good live coding progress today. Yeah. Surprisingly so. Surprisingly, oh, come on. You gotta have more faith in that. Some, somehow, somehow, I didn't get frustrated and, and angry at one of you today, which is the first probably. <laughs> and speaking from personal experience, I didn't think I was very prepared. So, <laughs> that's cool. All right. Well, thanks for joining everybody who who suffered fun. through this whole thing. Uh, this was a fun one. Thanks so, so um, we will catch you next time next month. Cheers. Bye. See you, folks. Have a great Cheers. time. Outro. Thank you.